Good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Gardner Symposium, uh, which has been the highlight of our Gardner Week. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the land on which Sikkit operates and stands. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional land of the Huron Rendat and the Putron First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Great River. This is today home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are, as Sikkids, committed to working towards new relationships that includes First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people, and are grateful for the opportunity to share this land in caring for children and their families. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you. I'm Zulfikar Bhutta. I'm the Chair in Global Child Health Policy and the Co-Director of the SickKids Center for Global Child Health. And on behalf of the Hospital for Sick Children, the Research Institute, and the Center for Global Child Health, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this event. So first, uh, let me start with a word about our sponsors and the Gaidner Foundation. The foundation, as many know, was established uh, in 1957. Uh, with the main goal of recognizing and awarding international excellence in fundamental research that impacts human health. And uh, annually, eight prestigious awards are given. Uh, and over the last 60 years, some 400 scientists have been awarded, about a quarter of which have gone on to uh, win the Nobel Prize, including two from last year's Gaidner awardees. And then we had the Gaidner Global Health Award, added to the mix, and I'm very pleased that in the audience today we have John, John Dirks, in whose name the Gaidner Global Health Award uh, uh, is, is announced every year. So as part of its mission, Gaidner convenes leaders in science and research uh, to share their work through events like the Global Perspectives Panel uh, that you're uh, going to have today. Uh, this is today presented by TELUS Health, uh, in partnership with SickKids, Center for Global Child Health, IDRC, uh, and Sinai Health, Tenenbaum Research Institute. Uh, and today, we uh, will have an opportunity to listen to many people uh, who have been recognized this year, and some budding young researchers who will have an opportunity to also present their work. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our laureate, uh, Global um, health this year, Professor Jose Belizan. And it's fantastic to see two friends, close friends, representing now the continuum of, of maternal child health and work over the last several decades here, Professor Belizan and Professor Siza Victoria. So Professor Belizan has been recognized this year with the 2023 John Dirks Gaidner Global Health Award for the development of innovative evidence-based and low-cost global interventions for maternal child health, particularly focusing on the perinatal period that improve well-being and care during pregnancy, reduce morbidity, mortality, and also promote equity in vulnerable populations. Couldn't be a more apt description of your lifetime's work, Jose. So just a word about Dr. Beliza. He hails from Argentina and, and uh, has a doctorate in biology and reproductive health from the Salvador University in Buenos Aires and is a doctor in medicine from Rosario University. Uh, he currently is the principal investigator uh, in, in the Department of Research and Maternal Child Health at the Institute for Clinical Effectiveness in Argentina. Uh, but he holds a number of affiliations, including an associate professorship uh, uh, at Tulane and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, I don't need to go through a long list of his achievements, but to say, that he was a founder and director of the Rosario Center for Perinatal Studies, CREP, and the director of the Latin American Center for Perinatology and Human Development of PAHO and WHO. And he also directed the Fogarty NIH Center in Argentina. So without further ado, Jose, the floor is yours for you to share some of your thoughts with us. Welcome. Okay, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Pleasure to be here. First of all, I apologize for my English. My mother tongue is Spanish, but I try to do my best in English. Um, yes, the, the title of, of the panel is Involving Communities. 
Uh, then uh, I would like to show you some experiences regarding involving community in research, receiving from them and giving to them. And some experience that I, I used to have, I have uh, particularly in Latin America. Let me start with this book from 19, 1984. I don't know if you know this author. This is a famous Chilean author. I would say the word feminist, or I don't know how to use it, but she promotes a lot heroic acts from, uh, from women. And also she has a feeling to, to try to get what women thought or women think. And what has he wrote? I'm going to read it. The Chilean writer Isabel Allende thoroughly narrates in her book, The Amor y de Sombras, Love and Shadow, yes, I don't know. <laughs> Digna's first experience giving birth in a hospital after having had five home deliveries before that. And what's she say about Digna? Digna had gone to Los Riscos Hospital where she felt she had been treated worse than a criminal. When she entered, a number of band was trapped around her wrist. They shaved their private parts, her private part, bathed her with cold water and antiseptics, and placed her beside a woman in the same condition on a bed without sheets. After poking around without her permission in all her bodily orifices, orifices they made her give birth beneath a bright lamp in full view of anyone who might happen by. by. She wore it all with sight, but when she left that place carrying a baby that was not hers in her arms and with her unmentionable places painted red like red, like a flag, she swore that for the rest of her life, she will never again set foot in a hospital. That's the way they interpret what happened really in many hospitals, particularly in area. So following his what she said, there are two things in the message. One, the use of evidence-based practices, some of the practices that Dina received are not evidence-based, and also what we call respectful care. And also we mentioned you something what happened with us regarding, regarding evidence, regarding respectful care. I was working in, in the Latin American Center in the, in Uruguay, that Sufi mentioned. And we disseminate a lot of evidence-based practices. And we disseminate a practice that is the women having a companion, companion during delivery. There was a demonstration that this, this have better results women having a companion. In comparison to what happened in our hospital, that women are isolated in big wars. And then when we disseminate this, one senator from Uruguay called me, Doctor, why you don't come here to our, to our group of women to tell us about this companion? And after I present her there, that, they say to me, Doctor, hey, this is not on, on yours. This is a right of the woman. And say, then, that, then it was the first time that there are rights that the woman must have a companion during delivery in Uruguay in Argentina, in many countries. Let me read this about the population reaction towards evidence-based care and mistreatment. In the last several years, the Buenos Aires City Congress and the National Congresses in Argentina and Uruguay have approved similar civil laws stating that women have the right to be accompanied during labor and delivery. This is an important example of how parliamentarians in a number of countries are recognized recognizing that evidence-based practice in healthcare can become rights. We publish that. And again, over the last several years, a new legal construct has emerged in Latin America that encompasses elements of quality of state care and mistreatment of women during childbirth, both issues of global maternal health import. This new legal term emerged out of concerted efforts by women groups, women groups, and network feminist professional organizations, international and regional bodies, 
and public health agents and researchers to improve the quality of care that women receive across the region. Okay, then this is a good example of how is the reaction on how listening what women needs, think can change and was done by the parliaments of the country. Let me tell you something about another example. Do you know what episiotomy is? It's a cut that men <laughs> that providers do during deliveries of women did, unfortunately. And when we receive our medical training, say every woman must receive an episiotomy and her first delivery. And we did it. Every woman received an episiotomy. But when we, I was an obstetrician, women always complained about the pain and complication of episiotomy, particularly during a very important period of their life. A new child, lactation, accommodation, really, it hurts a lot. Then we say, okay, which is the evidence base to do this? Why we are doing, well, we are cutting every woman and producing such awful uh, cut in her lives. So we, we try to go back to the literature and we couldn't find any randomized control, right? Any demonstration that doing episiotomy is better than not doing it. So let me show you something that for, for me it's really, and we found an article published in 1920, but the famous obstetrician in the United States, and that was what he said regarding episiotomy. He said, saves the woman from the debilitating effects of the suffering of the first stage of labor and the physical labor of a prolonged second stage of labor. She said, it undoubtedly, undoubtedly, preserves the integrity of the pelvic floor and the vulvar introitus and prevents uterine prolapse, rupture of the vesicovaginal septum and its consequent long chain of sequela. Birds in condition are often restored. It saves the child's brain from injury and from the immediate and remote effects of prolonged compression. The soft tissue incision not only allows us to shorten the expulsion period, it also releases the pressure of the brain and will reduce the amount of idiosy, epilepsy, etc. That's look funny. <laughs> the thing that say indirectly, preserve epilepsy. That's something, this is the justification that every woman in the world, the first pregnancy, receive an episiotomy. And this is true, look here, in, in Latin America, 91, 92% of women receive episiotomy. That's 92% in medicine is all, every woman. And the same in, in, in countries, like here, India, 99% of women receive episiotomy in India. We're doing a strong effort for women coming to have delivery at hospital. And when they came to the hospital, they make and unnecessary aggression to them, cutting them and doing an episiotomy. So then we decided to do a clinical trial. We did a clinical trial in Argentina in what's called in the last in 1993. We randomized 200 and 600 women, 2000, sorry, just to routine or selective, selective episiotomy. They were assigned during, immediately before delivery. And one justification to do episiotomy is to prevent severe perineal trauma. But the severe perineal trauma in our study was lower in the selective group than in the uh, routine episiotomy. And we say in this uh, publication, The Lancet, that routine episiotomy should be abandoned and figures about 30% are not justified. Fortunately, WHO made a recommendation following this article not to do any more routine episiotomy. And the Cochrane Review shows benefits, and I'm going to see in detail about the benefits of restricted episiotomy. There are now six studies involving 6,600 women and all the benefits that episiotomy involves. Then finally, a restricted versus routine use episiotomy implies a reduction of 62% in number of episiotomy, reduction of 12% in posterior perineal trauma, reduction of 28% in any perineal pain, and reduction of 
7% needed to do a suture. But let me show something that happened. Then this is one of the hospitals involved in the trial. Before the trial, they have 92% of episiotomy in oliparous women, every woman. During the trial, the control group remained with 91%, and the restrictive episiotomy group was 39%, a strong reduction. What happened there? We went to this hospital in a seminar, like right now, and we present the results of the trial. Say, look, that's the result we obtained when the trial, working the trial. It was probably in the Lancet. You see, okay, how proud we are, how proud you, you should be about, about that. Okay, we buy, we left the hospital. And what, what happened later? The rates of pityotomy continue to be extremely high. They demonstrate that it's better, but still their behavior implies that they continue to do it. And this is an important message for us doing research in clinical research. It's not enough having results of research. We need more in order to be implemented. And it's this kind of change of behavior. I don't know, change. We don't know, behavior is very difficult to be changed among providers. Then regarding this, I mentioned you episiotomy, uh, evidence-based practice, poorly used. And there are other interventions that is active management of third stage of labor. The most frequent cause of death in the world, obstetric cause was, fortunately, active management of third stage of labor. It's an injection of women in the delivery, and then this prevent hemorrhage. Okay, then what we saw is that active management of labor was really a large variability from places having close to zero to places of 100, 100%. This in India, zero. So there's two interventions that are of benefit and are seldom used, like episiotomy and anti management. Then we decide to do a trial. We perform a randomized control trial of a behavioral intervention intending to increase the use of two evidence based practices the selective use of episiotomy and the active management of third stage of labor. So that's why it's called implementation science, no? to look for interventions to improve the implementation of well known interventions in the medical practice. Okay, what uh, I'm not going to refer to much, but the, from knowledge to implementation, there are, we have first the research results, the summarized evidence, the evidence, the Cochrane reviews. From this, we, de we develop evidence-based guidelines. We implement the, the guidelines and we need the patient condition, the evidence of the patients. And we did a formative research to see how the providers have seen all these steps regarding the implementation of an intervention. I'm not going to win the time, but they say, for example, we think the research has had poor relevance, they, they don't unaware of the problem, etc. They also say regarding the developing of guidelines, there are authoritarian guidelines, they feel they're not participating in these guidelines that are unrealistic. And also in the way of implementation is authoritarianism with a lack of resources. There are many concerns that the providers have regarding the implementation of an evidence-based practice. And we did a trial. We did a trial with 24 hospitals, 24 Argentina and four of Uruguay, and then remain 19, only five was excluded. But let me say two things, two important things regarding this. No, let me let me go back. One important thing I would like to say that before randomization, we did a seminar in all the hospitals. And we present then the evidence base regarding these two practices. And also we deliver then a, a reproductive health library from WHO that is similar to the Cochrane Review. And then Okay, these are the recommendations for these two guidelines. And the intervention was 
many components. Have one is we select opinion leaders in the hospitals, uh, blinded. We make workshops about guidelines done by the opinion leaders. There was academic detail detailing from the opinion leaders. The academic detail is one to one approach, thinking about the evidence based practices. We put training then in manual skills, reminders, and audit and feedback. This was the intervention we did in these hospitals, in this hospital assigned to treatment. And that will be found. That's regarding active management of services of labor. See here the baseline after the seminar, they don't use it. Regardless that we did what to do and the evidence, provide evidence. But fortunately, in the intervention group, they increase a lot the use of active management services of labor. And the control group, nothing happened. We go to the hospital one year after the intervention, and fortunately, it remains. This change of behavior, behavior mm -hmm. remains there, and they have a high use of active management services of labor. Episode to me, also in effect, not, not so big than the other one. The group in, in, in intervention decreased from 49%, 30%, and it, after one year, it remains, and the other groups remain similar. So for us, was, uh, and let me show you uh, health results in the hospitals where we promote, we, we, we uh, did uh, uh, active manual services of cellular labor, there was a reduction in severe hemorrhage, in hemorrhage and severe hemorrhage, PPS postpartum hemorrhage, a decrease in 17% of severe postpartum hemorrhage. Yes. So this is a study, to, uh, this is what uh, implementation research we needed to, to do, as I show you, implementation research in order to change behavior. It's a great challenge to improve. Let me tell something. Sorry, here says a Victor is a authority in cesarean sections in the world and do these fantastic studies. This study in the Lancet where you show what happened in, in your city regarding the increase in cesarean section in your city, fantastic work. And then we're facing an epidemic of cesarean section, but really, really very worried. This is just to show, don't go in detail, how all the countries are increasing their cesarean section rates. Many countries will be above 50% of cesarean section rates. This is a study we did in our country. And these are, these are not hospital regions, different regions. And cesarean section in, in this different region, the province of Buenos Aires was 74%. And one region was 84% of women receiving a cesarean section. 84 is near us, everybody. So that's the reality where we're living in the country. Fortunately, North, North America is not increasing too much. But what are you there? What, what do women say at, about cesarean section? We did a, a study looking for, for, for different publications. The 38 studies involving around 20,000 women. And the preference for cesarean section was 15%. They were doing something against women's willingness. Cesarean section is not something of women. I want to have a C-section. 15% of women won't prefer cesarean section in relation to vaginal delivery. And, and any, that's a study we did with you, Cesar, remember? And any women, any country in this, all these countries, the preference of cesarean section you see is very low. 10% in Guatemala. And also this study in Brazil, Potter, remember Cesar? Again, few, very few women prefer cesarean section and the majority of women prefer the vaginal delivery. But what's the problem of this? The problem is cesarean session involves damage. The cesarean session without any indication is a damage. That's something done by NICE, the National Institute in UK. 
And every 100,000 women, due to the cesarean section, we're going to have six maternal deaths, 100 fetal deaths in future pregnancy, 300 women having placenta previa in future pregnancy, 400 uterine rupture, problem morbidity, hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> as you see, provided they're doing something that is again the willingness of women and is producing harm. <laughs> really we are very, very, very worried about this. And how, uh, let me finish with, I'm going to take, talk a lot about this tomorrow. Uh, now, the, I show you what happened with maternal hemorrhage, and now the principal cause of obstetric maternal mortality are hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And I'm going to show you tomorrow <clears throat> that we show a relationship between calcium intake and preeclampsia in the observation of indigenous women in Guatemala. They pour the corn in, in water, and then they add a piece of chalk and the result that, that those women have a very high prevalence of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Following this hypothesis, the relationship with the study that took 50 years, we're working on that, and we demonstrate that you can prevent preeclampsia with a good calcium intake. Also, uh, this is the, the results of, uh, of the Cochrane review, and Women supplementing with calcium, there is a reduction of 55% on preeclampsia incidence. And well, just to say, the, the, the author here said, group of women with low calcium intake previously, and the reduction is greater, 64% reduction of preeclampsia on women receiving calcium supplementation. And also we did a study that the study of preconceptional calcium supplementation of women before pregnancy and the results improved in 34% regarding the prevention of preeclampsia. And there is strong relations, uh, strong recommendation from WHO recommendation <coughs> that in areas <coughs> where the artery calcium intake is low, calcium supplementation during pregnancy is recommended for the prevention of preeclampsia in all women. But again, inequities. <clears throat> what happened in the world regarding calcium intake? Just as an expert in equity too. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what we usually see, no? In high income countries, <clears throat> calcium intake is right. They, they have, will be around one gram <clears throat> recommendation of calcium per day in pregnant women. They're close to one. But in low and middle income countries, we did this review, 82% of the women in the, in the low and middle income countries are having a low calcium intake. And there is 3.0 billion people at risk of inadequate calcium intake. But the question is not inadequate calcium intake, it's liability of calcium. Regardless that you can promote them, increase their calcium intake, they cannot do it because they don't have enough reliability of calcium to increase their calcium intake. And then following reaction of women, we're very pleased. For example, there is a preeclampsia foundation that is in the United States and Canada are from women. Uh, the creation of this preeclampsia foundation was a woman whose kid died due to preeclampsia. And then they decide to promote <clears throat> among women intervention or whatever to improve and to avoid death of the child during the pregnancy. And these pregnancy conversations say that for decades of research have shown that among women with low dietary calcium intake, calcium supplementation can reduce the value of the pregnancy by half. Women took the results of a study and they are promoting among women the use of this intervention. And let me show something in my country. This is a, also a foundation of women that the children died during pregnancy and they joined together and this is balloon. Each balloon represents one child who died uh, regarding the complication of pregnancy. So <clears throat> fortunately for us, it's a pleasure to see 
<clears throat> that women are taking their status as studies and they promoting among themselves to apply the result of this study. I would try to summarize what I say. <clears throat> I would say that, sorry, interaction with the population, the knowledge of their needs and concerns and concerns orients the research towards funding solutions to those needs, to those needs and concerns. Consultation and interaction with the population and providers and the participation in implementation will make deployment of interventions more efficient. The needed strata of the population will be the ones that will be guide us in the search for solutions with the greatest impact on achieving equity. We must seek links and partnership to reach out and collaborate with populations in the dissemination and implementation of evidence in their health, behavior, and care. And finally, we say that popular wisdoms never cease to surprise and nourish us. Okay, that's uh, some examples. I would like to go through the participation of community in research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you. So thank you very much for, wow, an, a very insightful uh, look at how things have evolved in terms of evidence generation and their important introduction into practice. So ladies and gentlemen, every year the Gaynor Foundation holds a very special competition, which is an early career investigators uh, award. And uh, the laureate has a role to play also in the selection from the finalists. And it's my great pleasure to invite this year's winner, uh, Professor Dina Zaratkar. She's an assistant professor in anesthesia uh, and health research methods, evidence and impact at McMaster University. And she spent a lot of her career in looking at difficult areas of evidence synthesis and collation. Uh, some of that is reflected in the work that was undertaken for COVID-19 therapeutics and nutrition. Uh, she's published um, quite a large number of uh, high impact uh, articles in leading journals. And today she's going to talk to us about uh, her views on the current ups and downs of evidence as it relates to global practice. So Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and to get to share this podium with such illustrious speakers. Um, so my name is Dana. I'm assistant professor at McMaster University, and my research centers on evidence synthesis and evaluation. So people all over the world are performing research to address important health questions. These studies though often produce conflicting findings are published faster than evidence users like clinicians can really read them and make sense of them and come with strengths and limitations that may not be immediately apparent. I take these studies, I evaluate their quality and I use them to optimally inform healthcare and public health decisions. Now, I often work in areas in which the evidence is complex, conflicting, or often controversial, and I act as a scientific dissident or a contrarian. And I argue that scientific dissidents gain a bad reputation, but that's not completely deserved. Um, and I think they serve a critical purpose. History is littered with examples of prevailing views and beliefs that have been rewritten based on new and emerging evidence. And this role is often played by scientific dissidents. And allow me to illustrate an example of when I played such a role. So let's go back to my time as a doctoral student. So for guidelines to be considered credible, internationally accepted standards mandate that they must adhere to certain criteria. For example, they must limit and manage conflicts of interest and be based on systematic reviews of the evidence. 
A growing body of evidence, however, suggests that few published dietary guidelines actually adhere to these standards. So during my time as a doctoral student, in response to this evidence, we organized an international consortium to develop what we consider to be credible and trustworthy dietary recommendations. And we called this initiative Nutrix. Now the first Nutrix guideline addressed the topic of red and processed meat consumption. To inform these guidelines, we performed five systematic reviews of the evidence. And by way of these systematic reviews, we found that a reduction of red meat intake by three servings per week, what we consider to be an achievable and plausible reduction, is associated with reduced risk for adverse health outcomes. The quality of evidence, though, appears to be low or very low. And if indeed red meat is harmful, the magnitude of harm appears to be quite small. But of course, the evidence doesn't make decisions people do. And so in order to formulate the recommendations, we also considered public values and preferences. We did this by way of systematic reviews and even primary studies. And we found that most omnivores are attached to their diet and red meat in particular. And even when people are presented with evidence of the potential harms of red meat intake, people are hesitant to make dietary modifications because they don't find the evidence to be sufficiently compelling. So based on these findings, we as the guideline panel decided to issue a weak recommendation to continue current levels of red meat consumption. The guideline was published in 2019 and immediately after its publication, it was reported on across almost every major news website, most of the time not positively, and it attracted a flood of controversy. But why was the guideline so controversial? I'll talk a little bit more about this. One of the major points of criticism was our evaluation of the quality of evidence. We judge that the quality of evidence is low to very low. In randomized trials, by virtue of randomization, we achieve more or less balance and prognostic factors such that any differences in outcomes that we observe between randomized groups can be confidently attributed to the intervention under study. The evidence addressing the health effects of red meat, though, came from nutritional epidemiology studies. These studies are observational in design, they collect information on the dietary habits of large groups of people, and then they attempt to look for patterns between dietary habits and health outcomes. These studies are also at a high risk of confounding bias, where any observed association between diet and health can actually potentially be attributed to other factors that are also correlated with diet and that may influence health. Now, people argue today that we have very sophisticated design and analytic methods to be able to adjust for confounders. Even if investigators use the most sophisticated analytic methods to adjust for a comprehensive list of potential confounders, important confounders that the investigators do not know about or have not measured or have not measured accurately may still be in balance between groups and thus may be responsible for patterns and outcomes that we observe. Biomedical systems and social systems are incredibly complex and we seldom know all potential confounders that may actually be at play. Consider, for example, an observational study investigating the effects of a vegetarian diet on longevity and all-cause mortality. To generate an unbiased estimate for the effect of adherence to a vegetarian diet and all-cause mortality, a century's worth of statistical wisdom tells us that we have to adjust for predictors of our outcome of interest, all-cause mortality, particularly those factors that may also be correlated with our exposure of interest, vegetarian diet. But I ask you, what predicts all-cause mortality? <laughs> Virtually everything, right? So on the right-hand side of the slide, I've presented the WHO determinants of health, some of them, and more than half of these could actually be correlated with diet and lifestyle, making it critical that we include them in our analytic model. But can a single study realistically measure and appropriately adjust for all of these factors? I would say no. 
There's also a growing body of literature that addresses the, the consistency between the results of randomized trials and observational studies that investigate the same or similar questions. These studies generally report that observational studies and randomized trials yield similar conclusions in most circumstances, in about two thirds of circumstances. But there are also situations in which they disagree. Then you may ask, well, if randomized trials and observational studies produce consistent results, why should we be skeptical of the observational studies? Well, evidence users cannot confidently distinguish between situations where observational studies produce trustworthy evidence and situations in which observational studies produce bias evidence until we actually have the results from the randomized trials. This inherent uncertainty makes it critical that we approach observational studies with more caution. Now, another major point of criticism was our consideration of public values and preferences in the guideline. 30 or so years ago, good old boys would sit around the table and they'd write articles about what people should do, what clinicians should do, what patients should do. And they called these documents guidelines. Nowadays, guidelines look different. Today, we strive to have guidelines that are not only evidence-based, but also reflect the values and preferences of the communities they're actually intended to serve. Considering public values and preferences, which is defined as the public's perspectives, beliefs, expectations, and goals for health and life, is now internationally recognized as a critical component of credible guideline development. Our critics, though, misinterpreted our consideration of values and preferences. They misinterpreted, misinterpreted it as us simply asking people what sort of foods they enjoy eating. That's not really what we did. So the appropriate consideration of values and preferences requires people to make judgments about what dietary modifications they find acceptable and feasible considering the magnitude of expected benefits and harms. Now, food is an integral part of our daily life. We use it to mark special moments. It's a symbol of our shared experiences and our memories, be it the joy of birthday cakes, the communal spirit of family barbecues, the excitement of trick-or-treating on Halloween or the celebration of a champagne toast. Food and drink is really at the heart of our daily lives. Even during unhappy times, we seek comfort in food. Who hasn't sought comfort in a warm bowl of soup, a hearty stew, or a cherished recipe from mom or grandma? Imposing unnecessary dietary restrictions without substantial health benefits can overall be detrimental to people's sense of well being and their happiness and their ability to engage in social events and share memories with their loved ones. Now, this was a unique experience to have as a trainee. The experience of having my doctoral thesis critiqued not only by major mainstream media, but also by giants in my field of study was highly intimidating and truth be told, a little heartbreaking. <laughs> Retrospectively though, I can say that this experience made me more confident in my ability to challenge prevailing practices in research and to engage in academic debate. Now I know that scientific dissidents are not popular, though they serve an important purpose. And I argue that it's our duty to be able to listen to heterodox thinkers. Now you may ask, well, Dana, do we not have a duty to silence contrarians in order to counter misinformation? Silencing dissidents assumes that the public cannot be trusted to make sensible judgments and to evaluate information, an overall paternalistic point of view. Silencing dissent also undermines the scientific process, which itself is built on the premise of being able to challenge hypotheses. Silencing dissent can also be dangerous because it deprives us of the very tools that we actually need to be able to counter bad science and misinformation, the dissent itself. Now, I'm not saying that we should believe every heterodox thinker that comes along, but it means that we should strongly resist the urge to punish them or to censor them. We should remain mindful that science and medicine are comprised of many and varied players. Money, power, 
politicization, conflicts of interest. And sometimes a scientific consensus is established because vested interests have purposefully transformed a situation of profound uncertainty into one in which there appears to be overwhelming evidence for what eventually becomes the consensus point of view. I support the democratization of knowledge where information is shared freely and the public is trusted to make sensible judgments and to evaluate the claims. But I also support um, initiatives to help the public evaluate health claims. But how can we do that? Now, it would be naive of me to propose a solution to such a complex problem. But one of my favorite randomized trials attempts to do just that. It is a randomized trial, cluster randomized trial, that was done across several schools in Uganda um, that tested the effectiveness of a series of school lessons on educating kids on being able to evaluate health claims that they encounter in the media. And it actually showed very promising results. So what can we take away? Scientific dissidents serve an important purpose. Red meat is unlikely to kill you, so enjoy. And silencing scientific dissent harms the scientific process and the public's trust in science. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that very insightful and <laughs> stimulating presentation. So our final speaker for this morning's session is none other than my dear friend, C.C. Lee. Uh, and C.C. Lee is an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and the director of Global Newborn Health at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, she has a stellar education record, trained at Dukes, and then graduated from Harvard Medical School, completed her residency there and has done a phenomenal number of things, including spending time at, at Johns Hopkins and also um, a postdoctoral fellowship at the International Center for Maternal Newborn Health. Over the last uh, decade and a half, CC has focused on design evaluation and implementation of interventions to reduce mortality and improve outcomes for women, children, and newborns. And she's going to talk to us today about community-centered design to innovate for global maternal and newborn health. Cece, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'll be speaking about community-centered design to innovate solutions for small and vulnerable newborns. So I did my pediatric training in Boston where there are five neonatal intensive care units and at least four birth attendants at every delivery. After residency, I went to work in rural Bangladesh where mothers, many mothers still give birth at home and I conducted postnatal visits with community health workers like Bapi shown here. This picture emphasizes the stark contrast of the different worlds that babies are born into. Approximately, oh, louder. Approximately 30 million births still occur in communities each year, and a frontline health worker is the first point of contact for both the mother and baby. There are an estimated 2.7 million newborn deaths annually. Is it louder? <laughs> And the vast majority occur in low and middle income countries and in the first week of life. My research has focused on how to design solutions for small and vulnerable newborns in these settings. This figure shows the normal stages of fetal development and growth. The first trimester is a critical period of the development of major organ systems. The second and third trimesters are a period of rapid growth and maturation. The normal duration of a human gestation is about 40 weeks. Being born preterm is when a birth occurs at less than 37 weeks before the baby has fully matured. Being born too small or small for gestational age that we often refer to as SGA is, being, is defined as being born at less than the 10th percentile for gestational age and is typically due to a restriction in fetal growth. 
We recently released a new Lancet series highlighting small and vulnerable newborns. In 2020, 35 million babies, or about 25% of live births, were born too soon, too small, or of low birth weight. That's less than 2,500 grams. These vulnerabilities account for more than half of newborn deaths, and these babies carry increased risk of impaired neurodevelopment, morbidity, impaired growth, and chronic disease into childhood and even adulthood. And hopefully some of Cesar's work can <laughs> demonstrate that even to late adulthood. Um, Community-centered design is a core component of the projects that I'll highlight today. In community-centered design, the development of interventions are driven by the priorities and the needs of the local community. They're designed collaboratively with inputs from community members and stakeholders. And learning from this process is used to further refine the interventions and eventually bring them to scale. In this presentation, I'll describe projects in which we have innovated solutions to optimize outcomes for small and vulnerable newborns. First, I'll discuss two projects that we've conducted to develop new tools to identify high-risk infants. And that includes machine learning algorithms that we've developed to identify preterm births, as well as a low cost tool to identify jaundiced newborns. Then I'll discuss new approaches for the prevention of preterm birth and SGA. In low and middle income countries, identifying preterm births is very challenging. Gestational age of pregnancy is often unknown due to low or late antenatal care seeking, low access to ultrasonography. So clinicians must rely on the clinical newborn exam to date and estimate uh, the gestational age of the newborn. Challenges are that common exams, such as the Ballard or Dubowitz, they're long, they take 20 minutes. They have 23 signs. Uh, they require training and neurologic signs, which could be challenging. Um, also the validity is influenced by um, illness in the baby or medications in the mother. And these traditional exams have been quite inaccurate, dating newborns to within plus or minus one month of an early ultrasound. So we wanted to know, can we leverage machine learning to improve the accuracy and simplify the assessment for gestational age estimation? The World Health Organization coordinated the Alliance for Maternal and Newborn Health Improvement, or AMANI, Newborn Gestational Age Study. This study aimed to develop a programmatically feasible, simple, and accurate method of estimating gestational age in the newborn after birth. The study was conducted in five study sites shown here, Bangladesh, Ghana, Pakistan, Tanzania, and Zambia by the partners here and coordinated uh, by the WHO. In all of the cohorts, they were existing pregnancy cohorts in which routine uh, monthly pregnancy surveillance was conducted. So once to twice monthly uh, surveillance to identify pregnancies. We conducted early pregnancy ultrasound at less than 20 weeks on all pregnancies, and that was considered the gold standard for gestational age dating. Pregnancies were followed until birth and a newborn was ex exam was conducted within 72 hours of life. A total of almost 14,000 pregnancies were enrol enrolled across the sites and we conducted 7,400 newborn assessments. At the first newborn visit, each baby had a comprehensive newborn exam that included physical neuromuscular signs of maturity. We conducted a feeding assessment and neonatal anthropometrics. For example, you can see here some of the physical signs, which included looking at the bottom of the foot for the development of foot creases, which develop as the baby matures um, in utero. Similarly, we can look at the elasticity and the formation of the ear. For neuromuscular maturity, we looked at uh, the passive flexor tone, as well as um, joint elasticity, which is a sign of elastins and relaxins being um, increased in time for preparation for childbirth. We assessed feeding maturity, as well as conducted neonatal anthropometrics. And then we input this vast array of newborn signs into machine learning models. We used the super learner approach that constructed an ensemble model that included over 20 different statistical methods with weights that were determined by cross-validation. The community was involved in both the conduct and design as well as delivery of the newborn exam. First, we leveraged community health workers and cadres to conduct the newborn assessment since they're typically the first contact point for newborns. 
During our training, we found that CHWs could actually perform neurologic assessment with high levels of competency with good training and high levels of agreement with physicians. We also tailored the exam based upon parental feedback. We reduced the length and added certain soothing techniques. We made sure the baby was covered and we also replaced certain signs that were concerning for parents. One example is this sign, which is the square window, which is a measure of elasticity of the wrist in preparation for childbirth. Instead, we replaced it with an ankle flexion that was a little more acceptable for uh, parents and families. This graph shows the ranking of the top 10 predictors of gestational age that were included in our top machine learning models. On the horizontal axis, we have the predicted precision accuracy of the model in days. And this is the estimated gestational age predicted by the model compared to early ultrasound. We can see that birth weight was the top predictor of gestational age and a model that included birth weight alone predicted gestational age within plus or minus 19.1 days of an early ultrasound. As we add head circumference, our prediction accuracy improves to 18.4 days. And as we include all of the top 10 signs, we improve our accuracy to plus or minus 17.3 days. The majority of the top signs were still uh, signs indicating the baby's size, but there are certain additional elements that show the maturity and development of uh, different organs, such as the breast bud development uh, and the foot's uh, palmar creases and ankle dorsiflexion. We were able to further optimize the model by adding last menstrual period to the model. And this model, um, the, the model on the top row, had an area under the curve of 0.91. That indicated that this machine learning model predicted whether a baby was preterm or not correctly 91% of the time. We predicted gestational age within plus or minus 15.7 days of an early ultrasound with this model. We also recognized that there was a need for simpler methods because this is really not programmatically feasible. Um, and we developed a model with just two signs, last menstrual period and birth weight. Uh, this model also had a pretty high area under the curve of about 0.88, correctly classifying preterm birth or not 88% of the time. And the prediction accuracy was 16.7 days. So in summary, these Imani machine learning models correctly classified preterm births about 90% of the time. And even simpler two sign models performed well with only marginal increases in prediction error. So the question is, the paper came out a while ago, but how do you actually operationalize this? How do you bring machine learning actually to the field where it can be used by researchers and clinicians? We've been working with the WHO team and machine learning scientists to develop a web tool that can be field tested. Uh, we're planning to field test it in the coming year. If there's any interested parties, please let me know. And we hope that once we have validated um, this model, that it will be available for the global community. The next project I'll discuss is one related to neonatal jaundice. Jaundice is an elevation of bilirubin after birth that results in a yellow coloration of the skin and sclera. When the levels are high of un unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, um, it can result in seizures and permanent impairment, uh, neurologic impairment. This is a very personal issue for me because two of my children had very severe hyperbilirubinemia due to blood type incompatibility. My son, Liam, who's shown here, um, had a bilirubin of almost 20 on his third day of life and was urgently um, readmitted for phototherapy. Um, annually, about a million babies develop severe hyperbilirubinemia each year, and 75% of bilirubin-related mortality occurs in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. This is completely preventable with early identification and treatment. Based on my personal experiences, I recognize the need that we need better low cost and accessible tools to accurately screen for jaundice in LMICs. This really stimulated the de design and development of the Billy Ruler. This is an icterometer or a simple tool on the left here, uh, which has different color swatches uh, of increasing yellow hue. A health worker will press the um, Billy Ruler on the infant's nose and blanch the skin and find the closest color match. Um, the colors on the ruler correspond to a respective bilirubin level. 
we developed the tool from calibrated digital photos of hundreds of babies with um, jaundice and used advanced digital color processing um, to create the colors on the ruler. Based upon pilot testing using the Billy Ruler in Bangladesh, we got feedback that parents were concerned about the sharp edges of the Billy Ruler and that um, the baby would get hurt. So we actually then, um, oops, oh, sorry. Um, created rounded edges uh, so that the Billy Ruler looked more like a tongue depressor and would be less likely to injure the infant. We also um, heard from community health workers that it was very difficult to know if the actually to, to use the ruler in dark lighting and in the home. So we actually, our uh, technology partners uh, added uh, a lighting indicator to indicate if the lighting was adequate to, to actually use the ruler and conduct accurate measurements. We conducted a validation study in two hospitals in Boston and also in Silet, Bangladesh. We enrolled 790 newborns with a range of different skin tones. All infants first had blinded Billy ruler measurements on different um, body parts in the forehead, um, the, ster uh, the sternum, as well as the nose and the uh, palms and soles. And then they had a transcutaneous Billy Rubin measurement um, and as clinically indicated, a serum Billy Rubin level. In our validation study, we found that bilirubin scores were positively and significantly correlated with both transcutaneous bilirubin as well as serum bilirubin with correlation coefficients around 0.8. This tool is intended for use in primary level health centers or even in the community where you want to identify a baby that needs referral for either serum or blood testing or even potential treatment. For clinicians, a level of 15 is really a threshold at which we would say we wanna get a blood test or we wanna refer that baby for potential treatment. Um, we have here an area under the curve, an ROC curve, and we can see that our area under the curve is 0.94, indicating that the Billy ruler um, identified babies who had a transcutaneous bilirubin above 15, about 94% of the time, and it had high sensitivity and specificity. So it really had excellent diagnostic accuracy for identifying babies requiring referral. As next steps, we're planning to validate the ruler uh, in larger populations of infants with darker colored skin tones. Um, the ruler's been mainly validated for use in hospitals and by uh, physicians or highly trained health workers. And we'd like to uh, validate um, the use in the community by community health workers. And one study in Ghana is even exploring the use by mothers and family caretakers. So finally, I'll switch uh, from my role as a, as a pediatrician to one as a, as a public health professional. Um, I'd say the past decade of my life has been really um, trying to prevent preterm birth and SGA. Rates of preterm birth and SGA have remained stagnant over the past decades, and few individual interventions have proven effective to prevent preterm birth and SGA. A limitation of the current evidence is that traditional approaches have targeted individual risk factors or individual um, conditions. However, we know that the biology of preterm birth is extremely complex. Undernutrition and maternal infections are both independent risk factors for preterm birth that may act through some common mechanisms such as inflammation, anemia, or epigenetic modifications of the fetus or placenta. These conditions may also interact with each other to synergistically include uh, increased risk. Undernutrition may alter host immunity and maternal infections may result in malabsorption or increased nutrient losses. Thus interventions that target both of these conditions more holistically may have more substantial impact on preterm birth um, and birth outcomes. We recently completed the ENOT study, the Enhancing Nutrition and Antenatal Infection Treatment um, for Maternal and Child Health Study in rural Ethiopia. This was led by our partners at Addis Continental Institute of Public Health and Professor Yamani Burhane. The study aim was to determine the impact of packages of WHO recommended interventions to enhance maternal nutrition and to screen for infections in pregnancy on newborn birth size and gestational length in Amhara, Ethiopia. We use community-centered design in the ENOT study to create and design our intervention packages. We met with a range of stakeholders uh, prior to and during the study to design the study, including the Ethiopian Ministry of Health, the Amhara Regional Health Bureau, Ethiopian professional societies and nutrition organizations to learn about their priorities and seek advice on intervention content and delivery. 
We also conducted formative research in the local communities to tailor the interventions and content. ENUT is a two by two factorial cluster RCT with two levels of randomization. First, health centers were randomized to receive an enhanced nutrition package or routine care. And then individual pregnant women were randomized to receive an enhanced nutrition infection management package or standard of care. The nutrition package was delivered within the health system by midwives during routine ANC visits at primary level health centers. The package included four components and was co-designed with inputs from community members and stakeholders. We provided a micronutrient fortified balanced energy protein supplement to uh, women who were uh, undernourished with a low MUAC. And this was informed by the Ministry of Health. We originally wanted to universally supplement, but they felt that it wouldn't be feasible or scalable. So we decided to target it. We also chose a locally produced and available supplement because that was strongly um, uh, preferred by the ministry and also a vegan product given the local um, Orthodox Christian religion. We tailored our counseling regarding some of the food restrictions in pregnancy because many uh, women reported that they withheld because they didn't want to have a large baby that would get stuck during childbirth. We also addressed uh, sharing of the supplement with family members. There was a huge demand for high quality salt. Um, there was low access to adequately iodized salt and we provided a monthly and routine supply of high quality adequately iodized salt. And we provided specific counseling on um, iron and folate and addressing side effects. The infection management screening package included three components, screening and treatment for urinary tract infections, screening and treatment of sexual tra sexually transmitted infections and reproductive uh, tract infections, as well intensive deworming. The local stakeholders at the Ethiopian Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology were very keen for us to generate rigorous data on the epidemiology as well as antimicrobial resistance patterns so that they could inform their guidelines uh, for their next um, ANC guidelines that they were developing. They were also interested in the validity of the syndromic approach and the validity of that. So we developed some projects with some PhD students on that. The lab staff were also very keen on improving diagnostics for gonorrhea and chlamydia given the challenges of culture. So we introduced a Cepha gene expert um, into the regional lab. This slide shows the consort diagram of the ENOT study that was conducted from August 2020 to July 2022. This was simply an amazing feat by our partners at Addis who led this work during a global pandemic, during civil war and flooding. We enrolled a total of 2,400 uh, pregnancies across 12 health centers who were randomized approximately equal across the four study arms. And we completed the last follow-up this past July of 2022 and have primary analyzable data in about 2,100 infants with primary outcomes. The primary outcomes for this trial will be birth weight and infant length. While the analysis of primary outcomes is still ongoing and will be completed at the end of the year, I wanted to share some limited uh, preliminary data that speaks to the importance of uh, community co-design. We found that the ENOT interventions had significant impact on increasing antenatal care coverage. On average, women had uh, 1.5 more ANC visits or contacts in the nutrition health centers. And in the intervention clusters, 72% uh, of women had at least four contacts, while only 28% did in the routine arm. So improving the quality of ANC services and meeting the, the needs of mothers that were identified through our com community informed design both contributed to increased demand for ANC services and the increased utilization of ANC. We hope that this increased um, uh, and improved quality will eventually result in uh, improved health outcomes for the mom and baby as well. So in conclusion, 35 million infants are born too small or too soon each year and account for 50% of neonatal deaths. Community health workers, can be empowered to identify vulnerable newborns and link them to essential care to reduce neonatal morbidity and mortality. New tools and technology may help reduce delays to care seeking for newborn illness. And importantly, community engagement can improve intervention acceptability, use, scale, and impact. And I'd just like to thank our multiple partners, our field staff in Ethiopia, Addis uh, in Bangladesh, WHO, uh, and importantly, also my family who made this possible.
Thank you, CC, for covering such a large topic and area so succinctly. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a 15 minute break. Uh, and when we return, Ms. Julie Delahonte from the president of IDRC will uh, lead the sessions. So, I encourage you to ask questions of our speakers. We haven't built in because of the of the nature of the program, time for Q&A, but this is your opportunity. So thank you very much, and we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Uh, for anyone who wants it, there is copy and refreshments. Uh, if you just go to the left of the stairs, past the blue grass area. those two that we can grab, like we can turn off.
Hi, everybody. We're just going to get started. So if everyone can take their seats, please. Perfect. Um, I'm Sarah Devonshire. I'm from the Gardner Foundation. We're very pleased to have you all here with us, both in person and online today for this excellent event. Um, we'll be starting up the second half of the program. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, as uh, the chair for the second session, uh, Julie Delahanty, who's the president of uh, uh, IDRC. I'd like to introduce her as the chair of the next session. Um, she's just taken over as uh, president at the International Development Research Center, which is an excellent agency, supports um, spectacular research and also has supported a lot of our past laureates. Um, so they're a great to sort of initial and continuing funder of uh, excellence in global health. Uh, Julie has nearly 30 years of international development experience, including as executive director of Oxfam Canada uh, from 2013 to 2019. She's also served as the interim executive director of Action Canada for sexual health and rights, and has held numerous positions supporting the government of Canada's development and human rights efforts, including as director of the Central America program. I'm very delighted to have her with us today. And thanks very much. I will let her introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, bonjour. It's my pleasure to be able to serve as chair of this session where we're going to be hearing from Dr. Zubia Mumtaz and Dr. Cesar Vittora. Victoria, sorry, did I get that right? Yes. Uh, je suis ravie d'être ici uh, aujourd'hui pour aider à rehausser le profil de ces chercheurs extraordinaires aux côtés d'une organisation aux vues similaires uh, comme la Fondation Gardner. There are many real life stories that remind us uh, why what we're here to talk about today is so important. Uh, one of them is about Ethiopia. Uh, about 220,000 children and women of reproductive age die every year in Ethiopia. For most, the cause of death uh, isn't documented because of weak civil registration and vital statistics systems and entrenched cycles of gender inequalities that too often begin at the cradle and persist right through to the grave. An IDRC supported research team conducted a systematic review of the cause of death uh, data from 1990 through to 2016. They generated Ethiopia's first ever representative data on the causes of maternal, neonatal, infant and under five deaths. This data prompted, uh, or helped to prompt anyway, the government to make reducing maternal postpartum hemorrhage a national priority, which had been identified as the number one cause of maternal death. The project also piloted a new low cost, high quality data collection and monitoring system suitable for low resource settings. Cases like this Ethiopia example show not only how much we need quality gender data, but also how we need that data to inform policy in low and middle income settings. In many parts of the world, decision makers do not have the timely information that they need to determine how, when, and where to intervene. This story from Ethiopia and the incredible work we're going to learn about in a moment prove that when there is political will and innovative research to back it up, there is a way forward. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Zubia Mumtaz. Dr. Mumtaz is a professor of global health with the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Dr. Mumtaz holds a PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a master's of public health from Harvard University. She has a bachelor of medicine and surgery from Aga Khan University. Dr. Mumtaz has received the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research Population Health Investigator Award, as well as the CIHR Gender, Globalization and Health Fellowship, among other awards. Dr. Mumtaz's work centers on global maternal and reproductive health with a focus on developing innovative solutions that alleviate the persisting high maternal mortality rates in countries with fragile health systems. Working principally in Pakistan and in Malawi, her research programs address three related facets. First, a critical examination of how gender inequality, poverty, and social exclusion converge to place women in socially marginalized positions, 
how these inequalities perpetuate their chronic susceptibility to heightened morbidity and mortality, and finally, assessing the health system's performance in the delivery of maternal and reproductive health services for these marginalized women. In partnership with governments and NGOs, Dr. Mumtaz aims to understand the health system and policy dynamics that determine coverage and quality of maternal health services in remote and rural areas. IDRC supported Dr. Mumtaz's research in Malawi, where high rates of maternal mortality persist, despite efforts to support better outcomes. The project assessed the government's efforts to reduce maternal mortality and led to concrete changes in the way research findings inform health practices. This project was part of the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative, a partnership between Global Affairs Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and IDRC. Dr. Mumtaz is gonna to speak to us today about fostering collaborative research engagement among health system personnel in rural Pakistan. Dr. Mumtaz, over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Belize, for this winning the Gardner Award. It's a huge achievement and well deserved. When Dr. Rosent uh, invited me, can you hear me here? When Dr. Rosent invited me to present at this uh, event, I immediately said, yes, you know, this is an August gathering and why not? However, it, all, it also gave me an opportunity to share with you ideas that have been percolating in my mind as I engage with the research community in Pakistan. Uh, so picture this. Yeah, I am a midwife working in a health facility in a remote area in Pakistan. It's a good life. I have a government job. It gives me a high social status. The pay isn't great, but I have a pension. And best of all, I'm quite autonomous. The district managers rarely, if ever, visit us. Suddenly one day, this bubble bursts and a, a, and a call comes from the district office. A group of women land up in our BHU and they claim to be researchers and they want to do research with us. Um, I don't know what the word research means. I, English is my second language, but it sounds very similar to search. That's it. They're here to evaluate me. And those guys in Lahore who never knew of us have sent somebody to check out on our work. Now shift over the focus to me, us, the researchers. I travel halfway across the world drive nine hours to a middle of BHU in the middle of nowhere on a road that doesn't deserve to be called a road. And I, the, um, the staff greet us with polite but pained smiles. And here I am getting ready to live in this BHU for the next eight weeks to collect data. So clearly you can see there's a juxtaposition of two worlds here, two different worlds, each with its own institutional characteristics, its own missions, values, uh, its own biases. This juxtapositioning happens every time the research world conducts community-based research. But in my experience, conducting health systems research is a radically different experience from conducting research with the lay community. Uh, for one, we are engaging with professionals. They know their business, that's, that's what they do. Secondly, we are uh, engaging with, we are asking them to discuss about their work, which means we're touching upon their livelihoods. Things become very sensitive. And which doesn't happen with the lay community because the lay community's engagement will at the most lead to high, bet, better services. Nothing, not, not, nothing will impact their income or their sources of livelihood. So in my presentation today, I will reflect on our experiences engaging with the research community in the context of health systems research in Pakistan. 
I will draw upon our more recent, pro mo the most recent project, scaling up of the 24 Salmon BHU initiative. Uh, traditionally, BA basic health units in Pakistan are the first level care facilities, one at every union council, the lowest administrative unit. These BHUs have traditionally been opened in the mornings only. And recently the government of Pakistan decided to transform them to provide around the clock maternity services. After a successful pilot, the, uh, the initiative has been scaled up to provide uh, province-wide. And we are now conducting a mixed method study, uh, implementation study to develop a detailed understanding of as the initiative unfolds on the ground and to identify even avenues for improvement. The study was based on a co-production of knowledge approach and involved close collaboration with the policymakers, the ma district managers, and the frontline healthcare providers. We got support from the key stakeholders during the process of the study design development, as well as the funding cycle. However, in, in practice, we find that continuing that engagement at, at, at different levels of the healthcare system has, been, has had its challenges. Uh, in this presentation, I will only share three of them in the interest of time. The primary healthcare system in Pakistan is, like all healthcare systems, a complex organization. But sometimes I think it is much more complex than it needs to be. It's an absolute labyrinth. It is also staffed by many, many, many people. And half the time, they don't know what they're responsible for. Once I saw a sweeper, once I, once I was observing in a health facility and I saw a sweeper watching um, movies at 11 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, I asked him what was his job description and he said it is to sweep one half of this 2,000 square foot facility. The other half is cleaned by an ayah. And, and I asked him that, uh, what about, uh, the, well, the cupboard he was ten, sitting next to was very dirty. So I asked him, what about cleaning this cupboard? And he says, my job is only to clean the surfaces, the flat surfaces. So whose job is it to clean the furniture? Well, the peon. So I asked the peon what, what was his job description? And he said, it is to clean the desk, dust, dust the doctor's desk and move files around in this small facility. So clearly, and there were three people employed to clean this health facility and the cupboard was still very dirty. And this did not just happen at this level, it happened at every level in the healthcare system. And I don't use the word overstaffing because that's not, I can't measure it, but uh, it just definitely goes to show that what engaging with such a group of people where there were so many people responsible for ostensibly one task, was a cha created challenges for us. And we had to go to 10 offices before we could identify an individual willing to accept responsibility and share with us, um, you know, and the processes around it. Further complicating uh, this complexity was a rapid turnover of staff. I can honestly tell you it was a, it's a musical cheers. We engaged with eight secretaries of health over a five year period. Three of these individuals repeatedly came into this position. Imagine if I had to engage with eight deans in a five-year period. It does produce its challenges. Uh, this is a picture. If you go into any office in Pakistan, the, health, the government facilities, you'll find this board which lists the names of the individuals who were, you know, who were occupied this particular seat and their and for, and their duration and the duration of the tenure. So in this, this list, the tenure of a chief executive officer of a district health authority, the average uh, time of uh, tenure was six months. And in 2016, it was two months. So not surprisingly, this constant churn makes it challenging to build relationships and maintain stable relationships. You know, a key prescription of community engagement is to build trust. And central to building trust is building relationships. But it is difficult to build relationships with people who are constantly changing. The guy on the other side of the table is constantly changing. And I use the word man because it's always men. Uh, 
you know, we, we, every time we meet a new person, we start from step one, these are the objectives of our research. We, we, we go to step two and we can barely proceed to step three and the person changes. It is expensive in terms of time and resources. It also produces a thinking of what I call short termism. The person knows there, and I've been told, you know, Dr. Sahiba, please tell us what can I do in six months? Because he, that person knows my tenure is only for six months. And this then, you know, we know very well that there is a timeline gap between policymakers and the researchers. Policymakers want their answers yesterday, and we research takes time. So we add to this and another and this issue like this of short termism, and really it is challenging to engage the engage these policymakers in 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 depth co production of knowledge. Uh, and the third thing that I'm going to wade into is, is a contentious issue here, and that is honesty and transparency. Our study was based on the co-production of knowledge approach. Trust, honesty, and transparency are the, are the bedrocks of co-production of knowledge. The literature on the research community engagement focuses on the transparency of the researchers, that we should be very clear about our objectives, et cetera, et cetera. But it is less well documented is the role of the respondents or the people on the other side who are co-producing knowledge with you. Our experience suggests that this is a two-way street, that while researchers should comply with all elements of ethical research, honesty and transparency of the respondents is equally important. And I'm going to now read something out which I don't want to make a mistake. The healthcare system we were working in is a context of poor governance. And it is a context where nearly all personnel, if they wanted to, could, could find opportunities that put their professional and ethical commitments at odds with undisclosed personal and financial gains. In other words, it can be said that this was abuse of entrusted power for private gain. We found cases where midwives were absent from the place of work and were instead present at the private practices. And patients who were coming to the health facility were being directed to the private practices. Uh, of course, patients were asked to pay for drugs that they should have received free of cost. And at higher up, vendors had to pay commissions to get contracts to supply, say for example, drugs. And this is just a tip of the iceberg. Like I said, this was a co-production of knowledge approach. Some respondents happily engaged with us openly, honestly, and transparently. And it could, we could make out engagement with them was a pleasure, but they were a minority. The most of the respondents, we clearly experienced dilemma in, in, in engaging with us, especially in how much information should they share with us? Because engaging with us had the risk that they might end up, we end up sharing information that they knew was against the rules and possibly not legal. So the, for example, a maternal death had occurred just shortly before we arrived at a facility. And the, the, this, there was a hue and cry. The villagers were really unhappy about it. And uh, the stated, you know, it wasn't very good because the government was trying to promote facility births. And if a mother comes and dies in a facility, that's not very good for the business. Uh, so when we went there, we were state, the, the stated cause of the maternal death was postpartum hemorrhage. It took us four months of nearly daily engagement with the four midwives working in the facility and other staff to piece together that the cause of the postpartum hemorrhage was a cervical tear, which was caused by the midwives using forceps to deliver the baby. These midwives are not trained to deliver, use forceps, and, and they had trained themselves using YouTube. And the reason for using forceps was to hasten delivery. So they've really moved on from use of oxytocin. The district level managers also knew about it. 
Yet all the respondents deliberately obfuscated facts and when ostensibly co-producing knowledge with us around in trying to understand how the health system structures and processes might have led to this particular death. So this really leads us to question, what is the validity of this co-production of knowledge approach? If the respondents, it also leads us to question the ethics of this particular narrative. So clearly there is a need to further deconstruct the co-production of knowledge narrative. So what worked? Because clearly we are working there. I have been working there for over 20 years now, and we have managed to create a space for ourselves from which we engage with the health system personnel. So the one thing that I think really worked in our case was that we have developed a soft interpersonal network of relationships within the healthcare system in Punjab. Um, it consists of individuals who engage with us, who see our work as important. Uh, we even continue to engage with the retired personnel. And in fact, one of the retired personnel went on to become a politician. So now we even have his, and he's a, he's a, he's a great backer of our work, even in the political, uh, in the circle of the politicians. Um, they, these individuals act as bridges. They allow us to reach out to different policymakers. They, they connect with us. So now that they have retired, you know, the next guy who was a junior who used to work with me, you know, let me invite you to, uh, they connect us with these individuals. And when you get an when we get a reference from a particular individual, then doors open for us and it gets a bit easier. Uh, I also have some, and I know this is not really the, doesn't work everywhere, but we also have some connections with politicians, family members, really. And those family members, then when things really get a bit desperate, then the family member will pick up a phone call and make the necessary calls. So really, you know, not very, not, it's not something that you can suggest, but nonetheless, it works. Uh, we also use some of the strategies that are commonly listed in the literature, but we have modified them somewhat. For example, we continuously engage with the interested policymakers in largely one-to-one -one in person meetings. Uh, we also have we have also maintained WhatsApp connectivity with, with these in group of individuals so that when we are in the field, if something emerges, we you know we share it with them and if often come up with solutions which you know may not require a major deal, a big deal. And we often see the results of this, you know, as an, an order will come out. To this. We develop short and crisp policy briefs updating our research on a quarterly basis. Uh, we, have, we make short presentations with small numbers of people quite regularly. And for the district and frontline staff, uh, we use creative animations to share findings and small video clips. So I like to think that my program of research has had some actionable impact. I will divide this into symbolic impact, conceptual impact, and instrumental impact. So symbolic impact is best explained by using an example. Uh, Pakistan is a context where the decision makers are the urban elite located in the capital cities. And it, this is a very hierarchical governing structure. The district level people, as, and especially the frontline managers, rarely have a voice at this table. And uh, so the, and, and part of this, of course, is the hierarchy that exists. Not only are the district level people low on the governing hierarchy, but they're also much lower on the social hierarchy. So what happens is that our research findings brings their voice to the table. Uh, and giving it credibility and legitimacy. So for example, one project that I had explored the role of the caste system in Pakistan and how the lower caste people are excluded from the healthcare system. And uh, after, when, after I presented my findings at the KT workshop, these people, some of the, the managers, came, the district level staff and the frontline staff came over to me and they were surprised. They knew this, this was their given everyday knowledge. They grew up with it, they saw the caste system, they saw how it acted at the healthcare system level. But what they found surprising was that this was research knowledge. They thought research was this some big complicated thing with lots of graphs. 
and that this was worth knowledge that was worth sharing with the policymakers in Lahore. So conceptual knowledge is, uh, I, the conceptual impact is best um, explained in the ways in which we engage, in which our research generated self-reflection amongst the uh, frontline staff in particular. So the particular study, our last study collected data from 50 basic health units in 10 districts in Punjab. So we have gone back to the same districts and we have uh, shared the findings with over 800 midwives and we are still doing it, still counting. Uh, we have shared with them findings about the poor quality of care that has been provided, that less than 8% of the women have the pulse taken and about 15% have the blood pressure taken. And what is what has been so interesting is the way these midwives have agreed with these research findings. I mean, yes, we were, we were expecting a pushback when you're showing such poor quality care. Not only have, they have agreed with these research findings, they know that we don't take the pulse. Uh, and, but what is most interesting is the reflection over these ex practices. They're, they're talking, discussing about, you know, why, why does this happen? What is the reality of their working experiences? Why do we need to use oxytocin to Heston labor? So it's just, it's just this reflection amongst themselves, which I think is very interesting. And especially because reflection, I hope, will then lead to further, you know, improvement in their practices. Now, instrumental impact. In my personal experience, that is the most difficult. Uh, it refers to making some major policy changes in response to the evidence we generated. Uh, I can't claim any major policy responses. Uh, I personally think it's a bit uh, pompous of us to assume that we can, one research project should lead to a policy change. Uh, nonetheless, we do find that there is reception to our findings. And for example, the data on the poor quality of care has now led to some action around providing midwives with in-service training and uh, promises. And there's some talk about um, gener uh, continuous professional development as, as well. So now I, 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 can, I could continue talking forever. I mean, I have eight, eight other reasons that I could discuss. So, but in the interest of time, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Muntaz, for your sharing of your fascinating research in Pakistan. Our session's next and last speaker is Dr. Cesar Victoria, Emeritus Professor at the Federal University of Pelotas in Brazil. Dr. Victoria has a medical doctor degree as well as a PhD in healthcare epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Victoria has honorary appointments at Harvard, John Hopkins, Oxford, and London universities and sits on the editorial boards of several journals. He's also the recipient of the 2017 Canada Gardner Global Health Award. He has conducted research in maternal and child health and nutrition, birth cohort studies, inequalities in health and on the evaluation of major health programs in Brazil and in many other countries across several decades. Dr. Victoria has a long relationship with us at IDRC. IDRC funded his work through the 80s and 90s on infant health, including his pioneering study on the risk reduction benefits of breastfeeding, which was foundational work that influenced global agendas. More recently, we were also proud to support Dr. Victoria's work to enhance the visibility of female-headed households in low- and middle-income countries through quantifying their role in the health of women and children. This work convened local research networks to conduct rigorous epidemiological research and deep gender in intersectionality analysis on the trend towards more female-headed households over time and across regions. Without such quality, gender, and intersectional data, it's difficult to track progress and can skew policymaking. His work addressed this gap through strengthening local capacities to conduct analysis on the growing number of households headed by women due to factors such as male migrant labor and armed conflict. This has prov provided an excellent base for further research and training and influenced how data on female-headed households is collected and analyzed. Today, Dr. Victoria will tell us about uh, global evidence-based accountability for child health 
and his experience with the Countdown to 2030 initiative, which monitors progress towards the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals aimed at reducing maternal and child mortality. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Victoria. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I really like the topic of this session. And I, I thought the countdown experience would be a, 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 good, uh, a good way of approaching this issue. Uh, this is a beautiful city of Bellagio in Italy, where lots of uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation has a, a convention center. And in the early 19, uh, 2000s, in the early 2000s, a lot of us were worried about the fact that low, that global child health was not getting the investment and the attention it needed. There was a lot of money going to HIV AIDS, which was great. Uh, there were a lot of concern about non-communicable diseases and so on. And there's this misconception that, that now my turn on child health was doing pretty well. Uh, there was not a need for great investments. And some of us didn't agree with that. And if you look at this person here, you may recognize a version that is, is that door? No, this is not door. I think I'll have to use this one. Yes. You may recognize a younger version of somebody who's present here in this room right now. And I just, uh, we got together, we're about 23 people. That's the maximum number of people who can attend a workshop there. And the person who actually led everything is Jennifer Bryce. Jennifer Bryce was working at WHO at that stage. Then she moved to Hopkins. Jennifer was really our, our guru and our leader. And Sophie, uh, Bob Black and I were part of the committee that uh, ran things basically. Now, uh, the key messages in our series were that there's still about 10 million annual deaths of children under five in the year 2000. That we did a series of systematic reviews and we estimated that about two thirds of these deaths could be saved by off the shelf cost, cost effective uh, technologies. They were, they, they were around, they were available, but they were just not being used. And we also highlighted that intervention coverage was unacceptably low and inequitable. And I wanna highlight the importance of coverage in the countdown work, because coverage is something that you can actually do something about. You, know, you can go to a country, go, go to an international funder and say, let's improve coverage. And we saw several examples here in, my, in the preceding speakers of, of, of the importance of coverage. And that became the focus of the countdown. And we ended up by saying, we need to make noise. That's a typical Jennifer Bryce uh, statement. We need to make noise. So we commit ourselves to running a series of meetings every two years to provide regular opportunities to take stock of progress in preventing child deaths and to hold countries and their partners accountable 
So the key words in the countdown uh, were uh, basically uh, coverage, equity, and accountability. So we promoted evidence-based interventions and we tracked country-like progress uh, in coverage. We also assessed policies, health systems, financial flows, and equity. We focused on high mortality countries, mostly those in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And we recommended actions to accelerate progress and to identify knowledge and data gaps. Our work with data gaps was quite strong early on. Now remember, this is 20 years ago. And at that stage, uh, a lot of things that we take for granted now and we talk about now, like uh, accountability and so on, they were not really uh, very visible at that stage. So we, we were scientists, a lot, of, a lot of us were from other agencies, but the, the you know, international agencies, uh, funders as well, uh, but accountability was the key word. And what did we do? Well, we actually, uh, in the first round, we called the countdown to 2015 because it was related to the MDGs, the uh, MDGs on a deadline on maternal child health uh, interventions and, and mortality levels. So basically at that stage, we did three things. We had reports uh, every two years, or then later we had annual reports. We had uh, country profiles, I'm coming back to these, and we had lots and lots of papers uh, on, on issues related to, uh, particular to child survival early on, and then we moved on to maternal, newborn, and child survival, uh, mainly after the Lancet, uh, the, the Lancet newborn series came out in 2005. I just wanted to remind you that uh, the Child Survival Series was the first ever Lancet series. You know, every day, every day we see a new Lancet series now, and that's not a, a bad comment because you're highlighting important things. You know, Zofi himself has done about 75 Lancet series, I think. <laughs> but we have over 200 series these days, and <clears throat> that was the first ever. And I, I'm really proud to be having part of that because I think we, we, we made some difference. The countdown partners included individuals like myself, uh, University of Pelotas, Azufi was then at Aga Khan and so on. Uh, it included country governments, lots of government people because we wanted to get action at country level and included organizations. So we had a, you know, FIGO, we had a, a IPA, International Pediatrics Association, we had the IEA, International Epidemiological Association and so on. And we had a great partner here, which was the Lancet. So Richard Horton was very supportive of, of us and he actually gave us the visibility that we needed to get things moving. Now, uh, this was our first report. Uh, it was, is there feedback in the sound? Maybe they can turn it down a bit. Uh, we had the idea of doing country profiles uh, because it, there were different publications around from WHO, from UNICEF and so on, but they were either focusing on mortality, they were focusing on uh, nutrition. Uh, not, nobody was really focusing on uh, coverage. And we said, that's our niche. Our niche is to focus on coverage. So let's have uh, one page country profile, use Bangladesh, this was the first report, which was published in 2005. And let's summarize everything we have about Bangladesh in one page. It worked for a while. We, moved, we later moved to uh, two pages. Uh, and we had conferences. <clears throat> we had a global conference in 2005. We have another one, 2008, in Cape Town. So we had standalone conferences uh, funded mainly by the Gates Foundation, very um, helpful in, in getting us moving. And we would bring people from countries. The primary audience were people from countries, the countries with high mortality. And we would present and discuss and discuss what's available, what's, what's, what else has to be done. Now, uh, after a while, uh, I, I think we changed a lot in the countdown over time, also partly because we were successful in doing some things. 
And so everybody wanted to have a conference. And then Women Delivery came along and they said, okay, why don't we fold the countdown into Women Delivery? You know, there's no sense in having so many different uh, meetings. Uh, so our standalone conferences uh, moved on to be part of other uh, international initiatives, but we still had a slot there, an important slot. And we had the report. So we published seven reports up to 2015. Uh, this was a lot of work. Uh, you know, they, each report is about over 200 pages long and it has the country profiles. The country profiles are the essence of the report, but then we also analyze financial flows and policies and uh, inequalities in, in separate chapters of the report. In our country profiles group, from one page in 2005, they became two pages in 2015. We've always given a lot of attention to user-friendly presentation of data. And I'm gonna tell you a little about, bit more about the equity data later on. But we, if, if we have a graph that's too complicated to interpret, the country people won't understand it. And not, a, not even us won't understand. I have to confess, Sophie, that some of the uh, global health modeling graphs that we see around, I can't understand them. <laughs> and I have a PhD in EPI, but anyway, they're very hard. So the importance of being user-friendly, and I think that's been highlighted in a lot of uh, uh, those of you who spoke before I did, you know, the importance of uh, making, taking your audience into account when, before presenting something, involving them. Now, over time, we started with child survival. The Lancet series was called the Child Survival Series. In uh, 2005, there was a Lancet Newborn Survival Series, and we expanded from uh, child to maternal, newborn, and child survival. And then we moved on to women's child and adolescent health. So it's been a big change. We're kind of following uh, the continuum of care early on from pre-pregnancy. Uh, uh, this was a concept that was also largely influenced by the countdown, the continuum of care, starting pre-pregnancy and moving on throughout childhood and now uh, also including child development and adolescent health. So it's, it's been growing. This is a real issue. Uh, do you remain focused or do you uh, go wider? And there are arguments for both things. Uh, I've, I, I tend to be a, a focuser. You know, I kind of like to, to stick to one thing and do it well. Uh, but there's also other issue that is just, just as important. And we have to also think uh, in a broader way. Uh, this is uh, speaking about charts. I'm gonna take one minute to explain this chart to you. This is our, our first uh, signature chart. And again, it took a lot of effort and time to do that. I'm sure you can't read what's in here, but it really starts from family planning, preconception, pregnancy, newborn period, child health, and later child health and nutrition. Uh, each bar shows the average uh, coverage around, uh, among the 80 or so countries that were being monitored by the countdown. Based, this is based largely on survey data. We did a lot of work. We continue to do a lot of work in analyzing uh, international surveys such as DHS and MIX. Uh, and each dot is one country. So if you look at the family planning, there's one country here that has about 10% coverage, there's one that had 80% coverage. So it also shows the spread. And very, very importantly, it shows where the gaps are. Newborn health, around birth, things that have to happen like institutional delivery, postnatal visit for mothers and babies and so on. There's a real gap here because coverage is much lower than other things. And then you go on to immunization and immunization is pretty good. Immunizations are pretty good. So we, there's been a lot of uh, effort in promoting vaccines. And then you go to uh, care seeking and, and uh, manage case manager of uh, childhood illnesses. And it's bad again. Uh, you know, we antibodies for pneumonia, ORS for diarrhea. Need some help? Okay, thank you. So this chart became really well used. You know, so it shows 
in, in, in a single chart, we show several innovations. We show which ones we need to give more attention to. And we also show how different countries are, you know, the variety among countries. Now, let me go back to the child survival series and, and tell you a bit more about the, you know, my, my own uh, role in there. And we, we had five papers. Uh, paper number four was on equity. We called it applying an equity lens to child health and mortality. More of the same is not enough. And our main point was that, uh, yeah, a lot of people kind of treated the uh, low income and, uh, and middle income countries as a single unit. You know, mortality in Zambia is high or mortality in Mozambique is high. But actually, we started analyzing these surveys and we showed there were huge differences within countries as well. And that point in 2003 was not well recognized. Now, nowadays, everybody talks about equity, right? But it wasn't recognized that within country inequalities were really important. And I started in, being interested in inequalities in, in my PhD in 19, early 1980s, because I happened to live in the most unequal country in the world in terms of income distribution, Brazil is now number 10 or so, but we were number one for a long time. Uh, and I, I started uh, doing a cohort study funded by IDRC, by the way. And uh, this is the book that came out of it, uh, Epidemiology of Inequality. And I started, I started looking at inequality because of my political views and, and because of ethical and moral issues, but I didn't realize that study inequality is really important for practical reasons too, because you can run better programs and you can target people who are really in need of your innovations and you can evaluate the impact of programs, but not only looking at national averages, but also looking at how each uh, social economic group or ethnic group or gender or religion or ethnicity is doing. So we really became a, a that, that was our niche in the countdown. And to do that, we needed a simple graph. And this took ages to develop because we had these countdown meetings where people from all over the world came and we would do several versions of the graph and show to policymakers from country, what is this graph showing you? And this graph, we called it an equiplot and we designed it in, in Pelotas, right, where I am. And in each circle is one wealth quintile. It can be adopted to many other variables. And then there's a line between the poorest and the richest, okay? So you, if you look at that, there are only two things that are, the poor do better than the rich, is breastfeeding. So they, they, the poor are more likely to breastfeed in a lower middle income country than the rich, but everything else, we see these huge gaps Look at postnatal care here, look at antenatal care. It's a very simple way of comparing interventions. So we have lots of interventions where the rich do much better than the poor. A couple, they're very similar, this immunization. And why is that? Because that's provided at community level at no cost to families. So it makes a difference. Immunizations tend to be very equitable. They're not completely equitable in some countries countries, but they tend to be much more equitable than things like antenatal care or institutional delivery. And there are interventions, which I mentioned before, that the poor do better than the rich, which is uh, like uh, breastfeeding. Now, this graph, we call it equiplot. And we can use equiplot to compare countries. For example, here we have institutional delivery or uh, skilled attendant at birth. Huge, this is just uh, Latin American Caribbean, huge gaps in Haiti and little gaps in Colombia and Peru, but we still have the indigenous people who are in the poorest quintile who are not getting it. So uh, it, it's a simple graph that at the same time it shows coverage because it, you know, high coverage in Colombia and low coverage in Haiti, but it also shows inequalities. And as I mentioned, uh, this came out of, uh, close interaction with the policymakers of countries. It can also compare trends. So now we have several surveys per country. And this is again, a skilled birth attendant. Look at Colombia getting better, but the indigenous are still behind. Rwanda getting much better, real success story. 
Rwanda's in every case of exemplars that we do, isn't it? It's, often, it's usually a country that's singled out for being so effective. But look at Kenya. You know, nothing's changing in Kenya over time. So we, 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 with a simple graph, we can actually get a very direct messages of how our countries are doing. And then we have the country profiles. The country profiles are also in our, in our countdown website. And there's a lot of information about equity in each country, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, data analyzed by my group in, in Brazil. Now, uh, the MDG is finished. We moved on with transition to the SDGs. The SDGs are much more complicated than the MDGs and many more indicators and many more goals. And the countdown changed. We changed from countdown to 2015 to countdown to 2030. And we changed quite a lot. And I'm gonna spend the next five or six slides before I finish, just let you know what we're doing now. The early countdown, we really focused on global analysis tracking the MDGs, we did several reports of over 100 papers, country case studies or countries that are doing well or badly. And we expanded to cover also uh, reproductive nutrition, adolescent health, and so on. Then from 2016 to 2019, uh, the, the new count, I, I was uh, head of countdown for a while in the first phase. But then we moved on to T. Sperma from University of Manitoba jointly with uh, Cheek 5 from APHRC in Senegal. And we really focus more on regional analysis and what is happening in each region. We really felt that we, we had done a pretty good job in terms of global reports, calling attention to uh, at the global scene. So we wanted to get things moving to country level. And so we have the regional analysis, and now we're really keen on the country analysis. And the director of the countdown now is in Africa, Chick Fai. Tiz has resigned. Tiz is from Manitoba. He's not resigned. He's still working, but he's no longer uh, holding the fort. And uh, we're now moving to lots of work at country level. We want to uh, work with people from country to understand what's happening and to uh, enable them to analyze all the, the rich wealth of data from national surveys and from also from administrative data sources so that they can plan better. They can improve their programs by knowing how to analyze data, transforming data into action and into policy. Uh, we also gave up doing our own, uh, our own uh, national, uh, international, uh, reports because a lot of other people are doing it. So every woman, every child came along around uh, 2020. It was a UN initiative. Many of you are familiar with it. And we decided to provide data and write sections for this global report because there's a issue about reports, which is the issue of branding. Different, different uh, groups and institutions want to have their own report with their name and their logo on the cover. And uh, I don't think that's particularly very good. I think you know, it's confusing also to have several reports and that kind of competition with one another. But it, it was great that every woman, every child came along because it's, uh, we now have our data in there. Lots of other standalone reports have also been uh, transformed into this. And uh, this is what the countdown looks like. Lots of workshops, in, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where the real issue is. And mainly in West Africa, where, where situation is, is most uh, crucial. And many of them in French, it's because it's, uh, you know, we really have to work with people who are Francophone. So that's where we are, doing a lot of those, you know, 10, 15 of those a year uh, with all people from the country. And I was trying to say, let, let, me, let me finish uh, by talking about what impact did we have? And I said, I can't come out and say, no, we did this, we did that. So I asked chat GPT. So, <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I came up with. <laughs> uh, increased awareness of child health survival, newborn survival, policy influence, funding and donor support, uh, advocacy and partnerships, many of those, and 
emphasis on measurement and accountability. Obviously, Countdown was one of many players who made this happen. We're not, not at all trying to take sole credit for what happened. But I think when we kicked off the Countdown, there were very few people worried about that. And now there are lots of different institutions and funders and so on. Uh, just two examples. Uh, funding for reproductive maternal newborn and child health increased quite a lot. We have the London School of Hygiene is, is, the, fun, is the group that studies funding for, for these activities, part of the Countdown. Countdown is a network of different groups doing different things. So the, 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 the cost analysis are all at London. Uh, reduced child mortality, with 10 million deaths in 2000. Now they're about 5 million, even with the pandemic, but there's slower progress in the recent past. That's kind of worrying us. I had a couple of discussions with Sophie about that. Now what can we do to to now to reinvigorate uh, attention to child survival because five million deaths is way too many. It's way, way too many. You know, if, if, if everybody had the same levels of mortality as at Northern Europe, we would have, you know, a couple hundred thousand deaths a year. And what are the challenges now? So just to wrap up, I think it's to maintain momentum and keeping focus, as I mentioned before, I think there are lots of new threats that there weren't around, uh, at least at this stage in 2003 when we started. There's climate change it, with a real impact on nutrition and, and health. There are pandemics. There's conflict. You know, with a lot of the child has that, that's that happened these days are uh, related to conflict. And a real issue of fake news and science denial that is really affecting, for example, immunization rates. Brazil had the best immunization program in the world until we had a disastrous president who was anti-vax and, and really contaminated a lot of people. So our coverage now is way lower than it was five or six years ago. And I think the last challenge is to continue to engage the global and national communities in the health and well-being of children, of women and adolescents. Thank you very much. All right, um, okay. so I'm gonna ask all of our speakers to come down and join us at the front along the table. Uh, and, oh, yep, we'll get that one back. Um, and then we're going to just have a, a round table discussion combining all their experiences um, led by Dr. Stephen Lai, who's a senior investigator at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute um, as part of Sinai Health. So he is going to lead this and uh, we'll see if we can get some good discussion going. Great, thanks very much, uh, Sarah. And um, we'll probably go a little bit over the, the time, but we'll make sure everyone has time to network and, and lunch uh, later on. So um, I wanted to kick off uh, with a question to the panel. And this is around the importance of knowing uh, the study community in order to do uh, your research. And I'll give an, an example. I'm involved in an initiative called uh, the Healthy Life Trajectories Initiative. It's healthy. Uh, it's a four country uh, clinical study with the, the four countries are India, China, South Africa, and Canada. Each of the studies in each of those countries is independently powered. Uh, and it's an intervention trial of a complex series of interventions that go from preconception all the way through to uh, childhood. The, uh, the focus is on health of young women, preconception, how that can improve uh, the health and well-being of their children. And you know, we did some, uh, I'm involved in uh, the South Africa study with my colleague, uh, Shane Norris, and we did some preliminary work with the community uh, to try and understand uh, the importance. So we went into the community and engaged with women in the 18 to 24 year group that was our focus and asked uh, them uh, whether they'd be interested in participating, that it was a study about their health and well being. Um, and what we got back from them was uh, they weren't 
focused at all on their health. They said they were just trying to survive, that there was uh, tremendous amounts of gender violence, there was poverty, uh, there was food insecurity, there was a general insecurity in their lives. And so my question to the, the panel is, how do we navigate this issue of what we think is important as a research question and what the community uh, thinks is important? And I should say that we restructured our study to sort of downplay their health and focus more about what could we do uh, to allow them to live their lives uh, better? So I don't know, Dr. Belazan, do you want to sort of kick off on that? Oh, when you say it, uh, you know, how important it is to listen which are people concerned, because that's something that we observe a lot. We feel that we know what to do, but the people concerned could be quite different of our how to, to see their, their problems and their concerns. So in any... So that, that's very important, not only to focus on their concerns, also to implement the results of the study. It's important to work with them because they are the ones who are best implementers of what is benefit for them. So I would say that it's crucial doing research to receive the consensus of the people and to act with them in implementing the results of the studies. Um, other members of the panel? Again, this goes back to, to, for me at least, it goes back to the importance of values and preferences. And in my talk, I talked about the importance of recognizing public values and preferences, people's beliefs, expectations, goals for health and life in guidelines. But I think it sort of bleeds over and um, also has to inform the research agenda as well, because the research is ultimately what ends up being translated into guidelines and into practice. Um, and the other aspect that I wanted to talk about is that sometimes we have um, a sort of myopic conception of what health is. Um, and it might be that health for, you know, for other people, or for other cultures might um, include, you know, things like being safe from violence as well. So it, it still affects their well-being, their sense of, um, you know, happiness, sense of flourishing and so on. So um, I would still argue that it is, you know, health outcomes that we're looking at because these things are so interconnected. Um, so yeah, so my two comments are public values and preferences in shaping the research agenda and having a broader definition of health is and the health outcomes that we want to optimize. Other members of the panel, the importance of knowing your community and, and what's important to them. One example from um, from our Ethiopia work in Ethiopia. I think we need to. One example from our. work in Ethiopia, where we were introducing a balanced energy protein supplement. Um, it was originally part of a multi-site study where there was a specific formulation that was a pumpy type product. Um, and that was desired to be common across the multiple sites. However, in our population in rural Ethiopia, um, uh, given the, the religion and, and Orthodox Christianity, um, the product did have peanut and it was uh, not vegan. So that was a really important consideration. Um, the other consideration was that for mothers, um, in terms of giving food as a mother, like I want to give food to the children that I actually see in front of me. And many of the women had other children that they preferred to feed over themselves. And so it was very important in tailoring our counseling to really, um, kind of let the mom know that the, the growing baby was also um, 
very important and that nurturing the pregnancy, um, it wasn't nurturing herself, it was also nurturing the, the growing baby and that the food was almost like a medicine for her to have um, uh, her baby grow and be healthy. And so we kind of tailored that counseling around um, the product so that she would um, kind of think of it as a medicine, both for herself and her baby, future baby. And then we provided additional supplement to actually, so that she could provide to her mother. Um, so there are many variations and we, we actually didn't go with the, the product that um, we were originally intending to, um, so that it would be more kind of, um, kind of acceptable in the community. Can I say something? Yeah. I, I would say that we, all of that, all of us, working on research, to improve health and the conditions. A must is to have qualitative researchers in our teams. Any team providing and doing research on health must, I'm sorry to use, must have qualitative researchers to do formative research. So it's, it's a must. We, uh, and and that's something new, but uh, we, we can appreciate the role of qualitative researchers in our teams. That's a good point by Jose. And uh, I, I, I went into a lot of trouble in the uh, 1990s to convince my medical school to hire anthropologists because they're not proper doctors, right? <laughs> and uh, we did so because I think we epidemiologists are really good at, at answering questions of uh, how much and what is associated with what. Uh, and we don't know the how and we don't know the so what. So it's a real issue. We need uh, social scientists to work in, in our team. You know, our, the birth cohorts that uh, we've run in Pilotas, there's a lot of uh, ethnographic work going on at the same time uh, as the epidemiological work. Actually, I would like to say a couple of things. Um, I must say, I'm surprised that we're having this conversation. I mean, I think we have known for a quite a while that it is very important to can you speak what? into the microphone? Yes, it's working, but you just need to be closer. Yeah. I, I think I've known for quite a while that it's important to uh, have the qualitative researchers on board. And we have known for, I mean, you're talking about the 90s and we're still 25 years later, still to having the same conversation. I think that is a bigger issue here. Why are we still having the same conversation? We should yeah. be past that point now. I mean, I think I've, I'm, a basic scientist by training. And I got into this about a decade ago and uh, I've learned so much from social scientists and qualitative researchers. Um, in fact, one of them uh, was when we were doing healthy, we, we went in and did some process evaluation. I mean, this is a 10 year study. So we wanted to see it, uh, is the interactions we're having with the community, with the participants, actually working for them. Um, and uh, so we asked them, how did they feel about working with the uh, health workers? And was that effective? And did a lot of interviews. Um, what, what came back in particular, I remember one uh, young woman who said that she was learning a lot. It was like being in school. She heard things about her health and well-being that she'd never encountered before. Um, and that uh, if she hadn't had this interaction, uh, she may have killed herself, like a, a lot of her friends had done. And it was at that point that I realized I'm a researcher. I thought this was a research project. Uh, I was doing a study, it was a clinical trial, we had planned everything out. But to the participants, it's not research, it's their lives. And I'd, I'd like to ask the panel, what is this? How do we navigate this issue of us doing research projects and the community uh, living their lives and having this going on around them? Who would like to kick off on that? I think I might be able to say something on that. So that was actually my experience. You know, we went in thinking this was a research project for us, and but for the for our health system research community, it was it was possibly their livelihoods and their work and their livelihoods. So clearly, we were at uh, um, I wouldn't say complete odds, 
but uh, clearly we came from very different places. And I think um, well, the solutions for this is something, I personally feel itself with the research. In fact, I had a discussion with you earlier on that we have gone into this knowledge, uh, you know, the knowledge impact and KT knowledge translation gain scholarship world without thinking through that when we when we do these things, is this the way to go about it? Because lots of times we are, we were no, I, I've lived through this whole thing. We were supposed to have KT workshops, we were supposed to engage scholars and engage the community. Then we moved on to, you know, the IDRC, the INJA project. I was engaged in another large project, 40, 50 million dollar projects in which you have researchers and, you know, we have a knowledge exchange body. But, but then we don't really, I don't think the, both projects did very well in the knowledge KT part of it. And, and then I wanted this thing. The second time it happened, I thought this was a natural experiment that could have been studied. But it was difficult to convince the funders that it itself was an experiment. They thought this was it. And I think we need to study this as a subject on its own. Julie, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think for IDRC, the point of the research that we're funding is to have an impact. That's why we do it. It's about the impact. We don't have as much, uh, we don't focus as much on sort of discovery research. We want to we want to ensure that it has an impact. So that kind of knowledge translation or however you want to talk about it, it's not just about sharing the research and hoping for the best. It's partly about trying to bring together researchers with people who may or may be able to benefit from it with policymakers with so that we can try to ensure that we have an impact. And I think the part of the problem is that often we're going in, we're doing research, it may end up having an impact at the end, but it feels very extractive to the people who are, are the subject of the research. So we're often not, you know, going back in and explaining what happened to the research, what were the results, how did how did it lead to some sort of a change. So I think I mean, it's a fairly small thing, but being less extractive about how we're doing that research, it, you know, it's, it, everything goes around, comes around when you've been around for 30 years, you know, it's participatory action research is now called knowledge transfer, basically, or now knowledge translation, but it's the same sort of principles that we didn't do well enough and that we need to sort of learn those lessons over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say something else? So what happened in our case was that once we shared the knowledge back with the midwives about the poor, the poor practices, they asked us that, how can we improve ourselves? They wanted training. They said, we do things that we were taught to do. And you know, we didn't have any ways of doing that. And that for me was a very big limitation. Uh, we, we applied for a grant to develop a uh, continuous professional development and we didn't get it because it's really boring to do. But some, some of these things are important even if they're boring. Um, I'm, 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 I'm yes, that good. To no such a surprise <clears throat> having relationships with the communities and the people. They are we have a question? There's a cash transfer? No, the, 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 the wisdom of the people. It's so uh, sabiduria. So sabiduria. Mm -hmm. the wisdom. Popular. We're never surprised. Sometimes we have to go around to share with providers, the empirical midwives, and observe what they did and say, okay, it's excellent what they're doing. I, I try to impose them what we're doing at the hospital level. But at home, they did it, for example. The, the wisdom of them is, is fantastic. So I'm sorry, I was saying the same many times, but observing what people need to behave. Providers and, and women, in our case, women because we were women. It's a yeah, we come from that. Cesar, do you Spanish? Yeah. Say. Cesar, do you have anything to add to that? Anyone else? <laughs> so maybe maybe the findings takes up something which uh, Julie alluded to. There's is um, we were actually part of a, a project funded by the Aga Khan Foundation Canada and IDRC in uh, an um, informal settlement in um, 
Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and it was a, a community that was very impoverished. I mean, they had virtually nothing and there were virtually no resources. Uh, and there were limited resources on the academic side and very little resources in the community. And so um, while we were undertaking a research study, a fair bit of the actual project required development of resources and capacity building in order to get to a level where you could actually uh, engage with the community um, to do a research project. So I, I guess my question to the panel is, you know, we have researchers, we have uh, providers, we have um, communities and we have participants. And often those communities that need the interventions the greatest are those that have the least capacity uh, to engage in the research. So uh, how much should we focus on building capacity uh, in those low resource settings um, even before we are undertaking research? Cesar, you're nodding. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the, you know, how much versus how much not, I guess I would just say that from IDRC's perspective, it is what we're trying to do or have been doing for, for 60 years is supporting capacity building and, you know, accompaniment, which can sound uh, obnoxious sometimes, but I think just seeing you know, for example, I was talking to one of our, our program officers, they're doing a research project with indigenous peoples in Bolivia. And they were saying, you know, we were talking about the fact that we're overstaffed in effect compared to other government, you know, we're not a government department, we're a crown corporation, but we often get compared when it comes to treasury board funding with, with, uh, with government. And we have a lot more people for the same amount of money sometimes that we're delivering, but she was saying, you know, when it comes to this uh, work with these indigenous people, we're supporting them and even just writing a visa or getting their passport because they've never left the country in order to go to a meeting. So it is that kind of accompaniment that sometimes is really needed in resource poor settings. And so just, you know, support for that kind of funding uh, has to continue. And we have a trend towards bigger projects, multilateral organizations, it's very hard for, it's been, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of maintain that. So hearing more about the importance of that and understanding that is really critical. Cesar, I think you were gonna comment. I was, I was just thinking about, uh, <clears throat> I think really the, the issue of uh, retention uh, of trained workers is a really crucial one. And I really like you. I saw that some people in, in your table were in the, in the position for one day. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was, uh, one day. It was six yes. Days. It was six days. Yeah. 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 No, there was one of six days, and another one was one day. Um, I, I've done a lot. Yeah. So uh, you know, we're really, we're really facing formidable barriers that relate to the way that workforce is retain, retained in communities. So go and I did a lot of work on evaluation of IMCI, Integrated Management of Childhood Illness. And in every place, uh, some cities, some uh, counties did not want their workers to be trained in IMCI because they would get a better job elsewhere and leave. That was a kind of difficulty you had. So, so I, I think we should not uh, underestimate the, the health systems barriers and the need to strengthen health systems mm -hmm. so that trained people who are competent, uh, who listen to the population, so will remain in place mm -hmm. rather than moving. It's a, it's a global problem with community health workers. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, there's huge, lots of huge turnover. And, and I'm not sure this answers your question, but just to relate that we're not talking here in a vacuum, we're talking here in the context of a health system or health systems, they're often dysfunctional and sustainability is the, the main challenge. How can we address that? And that includes better pay and better working conditions and so on. So it's very complicated. CC? Yes, I would just like to um, challenge kind of I think capacity building um, 
should be required. And I'd like to challenge all funders to include a component of that so that research um, that is conducted within health systems that needs strengthening, that they can provide that support. Um, for example, we um, are introducing MRI, a portable MRI um, for the first time into a rural area in, in Baradar in rural Amhara, Ethiopia. Um, this MRI is being introduced as part of research to understand the impact of our interventions in pregnancy and in the early infancy on child and brain development. But there are no pediatric neurologists in the country. There's limited capacity for reading these scans. And the only way we can introduce this type of technology is if we build the capacity. And even though the funding was so limited for this, because you know, you're limited by your budget of what you can afford, we said we would not do it without that. And so the Gates Foundation has been actually developing, um, developing kind of platforms for that. But you know, it, it, is, uh, it is challenging to, to like, you know, when you have a scan um, to, to actually figure out who can read it. And it should be done completely um, locally. It should be empowering the communities locally to do that. And I don't think it's ethical to do the research without it. So I think that should be required. Um, and another example of the kind of research versus health systems strengthening issue is that, you know, we were requested to potentially put the MRI machine in the, the field site, uh, just because it is extremely portable. But for us, the research in itself wasn't, you know, that, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was actually to put it in the district hospital where it's gonna be a lot harder a lot more logistically challenging to manage, but so that it could benefit the health system and that we could work on strengthening that capacity, even though we have zero resources to do it. So we're like, you know, finding radiologists <laughs> that are volunteering to read things and working on trainings and, you know, but I think the health systems, the research in itself shouldn't be done alone. It, it has to be done. Yeah, I, mean, I think, uh, so, I have a proposal to change the term training teaching by the term sharing. That's a proposal that to be for everybody to share the state of training. Great. So I think maybe uh, we need to um, thank the panel uh, for their contributions today. There's going to be an opportunity, I think, to network um, now in the uh, foyer. Uh, so Again, I don't know if you want to say a few words, so. Um, so we are gonna have, uh, there is a small networking um, lunch for those of you who have registered specifically for that. So we'll just have you check in at the door. It's gonna be over where the coffee was, uh, just to the left of the stairs there. Um, and you'll have an opportunity there to ask some questions and connect with our various speakers. Um, so other than that, I think we'll just thank everyone for their presentations and their discussion. It was great. Great group here in person as well as online. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us here today to celebrate Dr. Delazon as well. Thanks. <laughs>